live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in a Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Uh, well, hmm, still a late start. It's the last day of basketball camp. I know you all care very deeply about that. We have, of course, uh, more camp to go to next week. I can't guarantee that we're right on time each week, but uh, get a little bit of extra leeway in the drop-off time with that one. We'll see if it works out. Uh, but uh, we're ready to go, and not too, too late. Uh, I'm exhausted, of course. I... Uh, I still have a headache. I mean, honestly, I still have a headache from Trump's screamy speech last night. That's that's my biggest takeaway from it. I mean, he 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 shouted and screamed the whole speech in a way that reminded me that uh, you know, should a Democrat attempt to give a speech with even half as much, and I'm sure I still write it up, passion. Or speak as thunderously, or I believe the uh, the I was waiting. I watched on NBC to sort of see what what do the commentators have to say about the volume of this speech? Because if Hillary Clinton gave it, it would be political death. Of course, you remember when Howard Dean, in one unguarded moment, shouted for a second, and it was, "Oh my God, Democrats are so angry. Why are they doing this?" Of course, this has been the year of the celebrated uh, white anger, and that's really been the issue, is white conservative anger is populist, and it's okay. Even when, uh, but when Howard Dean ran, why, why are Howard Dean's supporters so angry? They're so angry at America. And this, of course, was the ultimate in America as a hellhole speeches, which I've been telling you for uh, however long I've been on the air, and probably before that in writing, Republicans love to run on the premise that America is a hellhole. It's amazing. But they have nothing good to say about America uh, until they get to the abstract part of the speech where they say, oh yeah, crap, I'm supposed to say good stuff about America. Liberty, freedom, America. It's the worst. You can't even go outside. Negroes are there. I mean, that's essentially what the whole speech was. And, uh, right, as Justice points out, it wasn't screaming. It was uh, the original German, with apologies, of course, to Molly Ivins, who came up with that phrasing. We don't plagiarize, or at least not intentionally, or whatever. Yeah. Um, Ivanka spoke. Good. Actually, I mean, really, honestly, I thought... She First, I commented that she should have been the uh, vice presidential candidate after all, but really she should have been the presidential candidate. She gave the presidential speech last night. And uh, as someone pointed out, the, the, the women gave fine speeches, minus the one that was stolen. Even so, stolen or not, Melania, Melania did as well as could be expected with a heavy accent and no public speaking experience to uh, lean on. Um, I didn't see Tiffany's speech, but Joan liked it an awful lot. I saw a little bit of Ivanka. Fantastic. Uh, better than some of the professional pals, men or women, uh, for, offered by, well, either party, really. She did a great job. She was very good. Um, it was inter- I don't think I've ever heard her speak. So that's interesting uh, in its own right. So anyway, the women did fine. They weren't scary at all. And I guess the sons both gave somewhat menacing speeches as well. I think the best thing that they could come up with among the commentariat that I was able to listen to uh, during and after the speech was that it was dark. Which, I guess, dark and full-throated are what they say about Republican men when they scream a speech and... God forbid Hillary Clinton should raise her voice, even just to be heard over cheering. It would be a shrieky, shrill speech and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that that's as fully on display as you're ever going to see it. The guy screamed his entire speech, and I was just waiting. Uh, and I didn't get to, I, I didn't round up the pundits 
the way Greg usually does. But uh, as a matter of fact, I probably ought to check and see. Did he round up the pundits today? He did. And uh, But <clears throat> the thing I was interested in is was uh, watching them be okay with a speech that he screamed the whole thing and how they were going to come up with, well, he's um, he's resolute, that's for sure. He's thunderous. He he was right, full-throated was the one. That, but, you know, that they were going to give him a tongue bath for screaming a speech that had it been given by anybody else in the, certainly in the Democratic Party. I was going to say any woman, but I, I mean, I just remember what they did with Howard Dean. And that's been the most amazing thing for me <clears throat> this whole election campaign season was has been watching them be not only okay but truly excited about the anger behind well interestingly both behind the Trump campaign and uh behind for a while I mean I don't it's not this I I'm going to stick myself into this corner the Sanders campaign, nothing like this, but there was a clear, a clear anger. I think that's fair to say, uh, among Bernie Sanders supporters. But I mean, there's anger among all presidential candidates supporters somewhere. There's some, and it's a matter of uh, tempering it for one thing when necessary and two marrying it to like the passion to actually do something positive for the country. You know, I, everybody gets angry. I get angry when you want to do something that you know is the right thing to do for the country and people stand in the way because the person who said it didn't have a flag pin on their lapel. That's, that's going to make you angry. But, uh, of course, if they're stealing all your money, that too is going to make you angry. But they, I mean, they jumped out of the way for, Tea Party anger, they jumped out. It was celebrated. Hooray for angry Tea Party people. Look, they're dressing up in Revolutionary War garb. They're not angry. They're just cosplayers. You know. But uh, uh, we're going to vote from the rooftops. Oh, boy. That's some passion. Hey, we're going to win in another state. Yeah. Oh, my God. Why is he so angry? I like that. I like the uh, effect you get by getting close up on the mic and <laughs> stage whispering that. What's wrong with that guy? He's going to have an aneurysm. Meanwhile, um, I thought it was possible Trump was going to drop dead at any moment. I had my fingers crossed, but I didn't think it was really likely to happen. Um, I guess best marks of the night for the Trump speech portion of the convention. Um, balloon guy, the balloons fell. That was good. Uh, makeup. They really did do a, a pretty good job de orangifying Trump. They gave him a, a relatively normal skin tone. I thought that was very well done. His sons looked quite orange. And I really thought it's possible. That, that, that's where I think maybe he got overruled. I thought it was possible that, like, personally, he would order, I need another layer of spray tan, another coating. Uh, but someone talked him out of it. They were concerned about the color balance on the screen. And uh, I don't know, although I wondered whether they manipulated the skin tone a little bit with the backdrop. I could not tell for sure the flags that were behind him. Were they virtual flags projected on a screen or were they really there? And I couldn't, I never really got a good look close up at the stage, you know, from the side to tell. Anyway, whatever they did, I, I, it certainly makes more sense if they were projected on the screen. The color was wrong. They got something wrong about that, and maybe it was just the, the colors didn't render the right way on the screen behind him, but they got the colors wrong the pantone values were wrong on those flags i guess especially the blue field was a very light royal blue rather than the deep navy that it's supposed to be and uh i thought the red looked a little orange there but uh i don't know then i thought maybe they did project those things on a screen behind him and they color shifted him so that his orange face would appear more skin like uh, but anyway, uh, I thought that was very weird. You can't get the flag right. I mean, they'd murder you if you were a Democrat and you had the wrong color on your flags. They'd go crazy. 
but you know, they weren't going crazy about him screaming his speech either. Let's see. Commentary from folks listening along and commenting on Twitter, which if you're listening along and you're near a computer or you have a smartphone or can hire somebody to take dictation for you or whatever, uh, you can tweet me during the show. Change the direction of the show, why don't you? Uh, with a tweet to me at kgrox, K-A-G-R-O-X. That is me. I, I do the show daily. David Waldman. Uh, so Bill in Portland, Maine, in addition to, by the way, starting us off with a morning tweet announcing that we were live and that I would confirm that Trump's convention speech was huge for the eardrum repair industry. Quite so. My neck is killing me. That's what's really happening here. Um, he says, uh, I think what the Trump women proved is that we clearly need to put a woman in the White House. And that is a great takeaway from it. Uh, it's going to, I almost wish that the conventions competed with one another sometimes like directly, but, uh, it'll be a nice, I think a good lozenge for America's raw throat, given that Trump kept telling us he is our voice. Uh, anyway, uh, next week should put a very different spin on things, but you know what? I bet you by next week, the punditry misses the passion with which Donald Trump delivered his address. Many people found it alienating. Many people found it very dark. But but the passion was undeniable. That's where we'll be by next week. Kate Cheryl says, Tiffany and her delivery. Tiffany's delivery was pretty good, but she was so distracted by the excessive amount of makeup and fake lashes. Huh, that could be true. Tiffany uh, has a different, little different look than... Uh, Ivanka does, uh, but I, you know, that's a product of her upbringing, I guess. You know what I read the other day was interesting was, uh, I mean, I really don't know what the dynamics is in the family there as between, uh, let's say Tiffany and Ivana's children, Ivanka, Eric and Donald Jr., which, who I think he calls Don. Um, and, uh, not to mention the dynamic between all of them and and Baron Melania's son, I can imagine it might be a little awkward, but they put on a pretty good show getting all together, and you know it might even be uh, real and genuine uh, affection as between them. But uh, yeah, uh, what I read that was interesting was um, did I did I put this aside? I don't even know if I did, but. Uh, uh, who, who said, was it, uh, Jill, uh, Filipovich, whose name I don't know whether I'm pronouncing correctly. I've seen that pronounced, uh, like Matthew f- says Filipovich. And, Je- is it Jessica? Phil- uh, anyway, uh, she m- was sort of analyzing, uh, uh, what she had a piece that was titled something like, uh, why men want to marry Melania's and raise their daughters as Ivanka's. That is uh, traditional roles for the wife, but uh, pushing careerism for the daughters. Interesting uh, approach to things. But what was more, what I took away from the article, in addition to not putting it aside, uh, was uh, that I guess when Trump was married to Ivana, and wanted to dump her to to go with uh, uh, Marla Maples. What part of his complaint was, you know, she's uh, she, I gave her too much to do, essentially. She gave her too much business responsibility. She was always working on this and that and her own projects and her lines. She didn't, you know, pay enough attention to the kids. And uh, that's bad news. So I'm going to run off and marry another woman who's going to pay no attention to them because they're not her children. Anyway, I don't know why, but it was, you know, I'm sure a BS excuse. I'm divorcing you because you're old and I want this younger woman over here. The end. Anyway, uh, but that was the excuse. And I guess to prove it, to cement it, the big complaint was, well, Ivana, she's always busy with her projects. She doesn't pay enough time, uh, attention to the kids. Then by the time Marla Maples was too old and he wanted to go, date uh, Melania his complaint was you know she's never with me she's always staying home with Tiffany too much time with the with the daughter it's just she's not holding up her end of the bargain we're never together anymore 
buy. So yeah, he wants what he wants, which is a, a new model every couple of years. I guess at some point he becomes, maybe he becomes too old for, or feels like it becomes too ridiculous or whatever. Maybe this is the last one. I really, I don't know. But actually, that reminds me, I have another piece put aside. When it comes time to shift off of the convention, uh, the, the, it, it reminds me of, I found a great piece sort of at random that comments on the career balance, career life, home life balance for women and some of the problems that it causes. I mean, duh, it causes lots of problems, but a very unique take, I thought, on a very technical point. So hopefully I can come back to that one. Let's take a look at some of the other comments. Parlio saying, uh, this might come in handy after that speech. Let's see. Oh, a comment from, a comment to Jesse LaGreca. Hey, Jesse, how's it going? Good read. Robert Paxton's The Five Stages of Fascism. I say, ah, yes, I remember. Of course, that one. Uh, he certainly put on all the, uh, you know, put out all the elements in the speech. Uh, what they were calling dark was, of course, extraordinarily alienating. I also thought it was interesting. I watched a little bit, whatever I could stomach, of the, um, you know, massive pile on on CNN. They had a gigantic panel of everybody yelling at each other. Van Jones was there, and. Uh, Oh, Anna Navarro, I think, was there. Also, Jeffrey Lord, that wacko. And uh, Corey Lewandowski, which is just absurd. The guy was campaign manager, you know, yesterday, essentially. And he's still doing it. And he's raising money for a Trump super PAC. And they're like, yeah, post-convention speech. Uh, Corey Lewandowski, what would you think? Oh, well, guess what? It was awesome. Anyway, every time Van Jones would speak, and, you know, he's a pretty forceful speaker. And uh, they did a pretty good job attempting to keep people from jumping on one another in crosstalk, but eventually by the end it broke down. You know you know who they did a really good job for? They, uh, or maybe it's a, something about the way Van Jones speaks, or maybe it's misogyny, and they didn't jump on Van's comments the way they did on Anna Navarro's. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's probably it. That's what, now that I think about it, more what, what it felt like. But every time Van Jones would suggest even, that somebody in America might have found some part of the speech offensive. The the camera, maybe it was the angle, maybe it was just really telling the truth, the camera view of Lewandowski and Jeff Lord glaring like daggers in the eyes at Van Jones every time he was, oh my God, here he goes again playing identity politics because somebody might have taken offense at being called a rapist and say that we should chuck him out of the country. What's he talking about? He doesn't understand anything. Uh, but boy, were they looking at him with murder in their eyes. It was very weird. The whole thing was very weird. Uh, I guess some of the analysis pointed out also uh, no Muslim ban in the speech. The, he found... Pivoty words, I guess, for that. That's the big, well, I don't think that was the big pivot, but maybe that other people think so. Well, he backed off of the Muslim thing. It became that we're going to, I guess, what, stop, uh, ban immigration from countries that have been, uh, you know, have fallen prey to disruption by how, I forgot how he put it exactly, by terrorism. Essentially, you know, a, if you come from a country where there's a, what I think is a lot of terrorists, uh, we're going to block your entry. And guess what? W what countries do you think he's going to think there's a lot of terrorists in? Muslim countries. So they found a way to to pretty that up, legally speaking, constitutionally speaking. And that's the one they went with. The pivot, as it were, if there was a pivot in there, I think he tried to do it over uh, over gay and lesbian rights. And it was, I, it was clearly the first time he had ever said LGBTQ to altogether in that order in his life. This is a guy who, uh, to this point in his life, if we're lucky, he's just referred to that community as the gays. Uh, it, you know, if he's prettying it up, if he's out there, if he thinks he's being polite, the gays love me or whatever, right? You know, that 
10 years ago, that was, I'm sure, still the homos. Uh, but, or, you know, the queers until the, the community actually said, screw you, we're taking that, you know, Q bomb away from you. We'll take that one. Thank you very much. But I'm sure that in polite company, he probably thought he was being really considerate, saying, the gays love me. The gays need to do this. The gays need to do that. Well, I can't let the gays marry. Can let the gays. I don't care if the gays marry. And then, of course, people said, you know, there's more than just gays. And by the way, uh, that doesn't cover everybody. Uh, as it happens, uh, lesbians would prefer to be simply referred to as lesbians. That's what they are. It's okay to say that. Okay, gays and lesbians. And then, of course, then, uh, you know, it, then it gets into, well, there's stupid PC stuff. Now I got to have T's and G's, Q's and God knows whatever else. Anyway, I think the speech writer was, uh, who did they say that was? Um, Stephen Miller. I guess, was the guy who got profiled as having built the bulk of this speech. Uh, and I guess, well, many in the community think that he is gay. And I wouldn't be surprised if he threw that phrasing in there saying, well, it's important, one, not to alienate them. Two, uh, it, it's important to realize this battle is pretty much lost. And really, I think even personally, Donald Trump is far less, I think, personally anti-gay, certainly than Mike Pence, his running mate, and most of the Republican Party. The guy, you know, he's had some exposure to the LGBTQ community, even though he doesn't even know it. Uh, and, and I guess maybe that even accounts for part of his language. He's he's had exposure to the gays, because I'm sure he's run into a gay businessman here and there. And he's a New Yorker. And I don't think it bothers him the way it bothers uh, people from the real America, the heartland, it's, uh, who are sure they don't know anybody who's gay. And if they did, they would know because something would happen. They, I don't know, the light would go on. Roy Cohn, yes, Justice Putnam reminds me that. I just think he's he's a lot more gay and lesbian tolerant than most Republicans probably are. So he thinks he's really, you know, progressive almost on the issue. And I think the speechwriters told them, uh, yeah, all right, well, so the the pivot is you will say LGBTQ instead of the homos or whatever you're used to saying. And, uh, and, and you'll deliver this message of, you know, you're okay with me. We shouldn't kill you, right? That That was the big message, by the way, a message of support post Orlando. They're wonderful people. That's nice. Let's not kill them. Let's do everything we can, essentially, the, now what the outcome was, let's do everything we can to make sure foreign ideologies of hatred don't kill them. Domestic ones mm, might make them vice president. But, yeah, that was a big hole in it, and they they knew it. And, uh, I, I, anyway, so this was clearly the first time he had ever said this. And I who knew? I think the speechwriter put it in there. Like, oh, yeah, well, you're going to, instead of saying the gays, you're going to say the LGBTQ community, which to you and me is like, sure, it's the LGBTQ community. LGBTQ, LGBTQ. We can say it ten times fast. It's okay. Donald Trump, who knew he needed coaching in how to say English letters in order? Why do you keep doing, what was he? He was saying like LGBTQ community. Like he wasn't sure if, am I done with the letters? Is that all there is? You never know. They may add another one at any moment. That's true. But uh, he's he's stumbling over this thing. It sounded like he was talking about, a, you know, a, a person. By the end of the speech, I'm like, is it a person he's talking about? A person named LG? Middle initial B. LGBTQ. That's the, the speech writer on my staff. Uh, but, yeah, I guess it never occurred to them we are going to have to coach him. I want you to just say these letters in order. Can you do this for me? L L. G G B B T T Q Q. Now all together. L G B T Q C O M Munity. I, I don't know what else was gonna be ruined by that, but no one thought to teach him how to read letters in order. He had no problem with the TSA, right, when he was angry at the TSA at the airports. Like he's ever gone through airport security. Hello, 
you private chat guys, they don't deal with that. But he's heard people don't like the T-S-A. So he had to have something to say about that one. Ah. Anyway, it was garbage from start to finish. And, uh, oh yes, a good observation I thought made by Chris Hayes. Uh, a tweet retweeted many times that, uh, of course, is now lost because I put it in pocket. And when you put in a specific tweet, or you think you're putting in a specific tweet in pocket instead, it just uh, sends you to that person's uh, Twitter feed and ruins the whole thing. So if I just, uh, maybe if I back up to the list view, it'll remind me of uh, the one I wanted. No, it wasn't. But anyway, uh, the gist of it was that he invoked this coded distancing between himself, like when he spoke about inner cities, which Armando observed. It's pretty 70s phrasing, right? I mean, he's, he's there, he's still stuck there. He used to worry about the homos and the inner cities. No, sir, we don't say the homos anymore. We say the LGBTQ community. LGBTQ community. And, of course, I don't know. What do we even say now? Sometimes we say urban, uh, but uh, you know, inner cities, yeah. Well, he revived that phrase. But when he was referring to the problems of the inner cities, that was a they problem. They can't even control themselves in the inner cities. They, they, they. But when it came to uh, talking to the the bricklayers and the coal miners and steel workers that were going to put back to work, that was all a you thing. I'm with you. So you and we, when it came to white working class, and they, when it was inner cities. I thought that was a pretty good observation, too, even if I can't bring you his exact wording on it. So, anyway, let's take a quick look just to get it, make sure we're covering all our bases in terms of the actual news at the abbreviated Pundit Roundup for today. We don't have Greg with us, of course. He's got meetings, probably meetings about being on vacation next week, so we're really going to miss him then. Uh, big point, and he starts this abbreviated Pundit Roundup with a chart on it. The Great Leader Personality Convention finally ends, so what's next? The chart, of course, is violent crime in the United States because the Great Leader's speech uh, for a long time lingered on. It's a hellhole, America. It's the worst. Can you imagine? Can you? I mean, believe me, it's the worst. You go outside, you're going to be put through a wood chipper by Negro gangs roving the streets. They're going to mistake you for a police officer and dress up as a terrorist and murder you. He had a lot to say about how bad it is and how much worse it's getting and how cops are being killed left and right. You can't even put on a, a uniform, a blue hat of any kind, and you're dead meat. That's why my hats are red and white. You'd think that there would be a blue one in the mix, but there isn't because I'm afraid I'll be a, mistaken for a cop and killed by marauding gang gangs roving the street. Uh, looking to impose uh, inner city socialism or something. Uh, violent crime, of course, uh, way down over many, many years. Uh, this chart actually just begins in 1990, and you can see this precipitous drop here in terms of violent crimes per 100,000 people, it being up in the neighborhood of, oh, I don't know, uh, 750 or so in the... Uh, early 90s and then dropping all the way down. The latest estimate, up 1% for the first half of 2015 in this chart, has it down around 400 violent crimes per 100,000 people. Eh, better, you know? But of course, <clears throat> well, uh, Greg notes in his caption for the graph, uh, Paul Manafort and Trump campaign, and that's the way he writes it, Paul Manafort slash Trump campaign, says the FBI stats don't count because the FBI is in the tank for Hillary. So obvious. Um, well, okay. The speech, as he points out, was too late for all the responses because he had to, you know, go to sleep at some point. And, and he, what did he do? An hour and a half? They, and that was interesting too. They all noted, well, this could be the longest acceptance speech in modern televised convention history. Though they didn't have anything to say about it being the loudest among them, but it was that as well. 
The speech was too late for all the responses, but we do have a few, a couple of tweeted responses that Greg collected. Jamil Smith saying, I've never seen a politician deliver a more irresponsible speech. These are words that provoke more than anger and paranoia. And indeed, I did see a number of people say, terrified. I was terrified of the speech. I I think CNN spent a little bit of time talking to a, a focus group, which was almost entirely white, but... I did. I think I saw two black guys in there, and they asked people. It was interesting. I was wondering about this. I'm glad they asked. Uh, how many of you, uh, you know, raise your hand if you feel like you were more likely to vote for Donald Trump now after the speech? And I figured that the number would be in the 25 percent range, which is the base, you know, uh, support. But it was about half, half the room. And granted, focus group people tend to be different than you and me. Let's say, uh, you know, they're, they're hand selected for being eh, somewhat interested, but not particularly informed. But uh, they may not have seen. I don't know. Maybe they thought this was an exciting speech because he screamed it. And they did uh, keep them sort of isolated from they weren't allowed to, you know, watch uh, punditry about the speech as it was going on. They weren't allowed to monitor social media, etc., so that their impressions were their own. Very interesting. Uh, Norm Ornstein, his observation, if Leni Riefenstahl were, are, are alive, Trump would hire her to film his speech, then not pay her. That's the better part of it. Uh, Gary Kasparov has a comment on that one. I've heard this sort of speech a lot in the last 15 years, and trust me, it doesn't sound any better in Russian, let alone German. Jeffrey Vagel. I'm going to have to, like, check up on who are some of these people, if that's possible. Uh, you know, I'm terrible with the names and identities. Jeffrey Vagel, uh, Privacy, Surveillance, and Race, and the Ethics of Technology at Penn Law. So, Jeffrey, uh, your comment. Of course, I've, I've ruined things here. And uh, Okay, there we go. Uh, he says, and even if slash when he loses in November, millions of newly empowered bigots will still be out there. That's true. And that, by the way, in response to another tweet from Jelani Cobb, who says the entire spectacle is terrifying. This is how democracy dies. Yeah, that's that's about right. But there's the terrifying word again. Uh, yeah. And I also saw somebody uh, observe you know, he he invoked the rigged system complaint again, which he stopped doing. Once he won the primaries, he stopped talking about the rigged system. And now, though, he realizes, oh, my God, uh, general election, I better start talking about rigging again. You're going to have he's going to lose and he's going to hype up a bunch of nuts and say, I only lost because it's rigged. And I don't really know what they're going to do with that one. It's a little worrying. Jamel Bowie said, this is not a normal speech. This is not a normal candidate. Do not forget that. That's true. I was looking for a little bit more of that in the punditry afterwards. Not to be found. They pretty much normalized it. There really was no discussion about anything other than the fact that it was dark. I'm amazed that nobody mentioned he yelled the whole thing. I'm also amazed that nobody mentioned that, uh, well, somebody did notice in the uh, focus group. Somebody noticed uh, what I think is Trump's verbal tick. His version of Sarah Palin's also, that she would just gratuitously throw also in there. I always wondered why also. Like, also doesn't help you in any way. Uh, you know, lots of people, there you go, right? There's a verbal crutch right there that you know that I do all the time. I, th- those things are kind of meaningless, but she uses the word also for them. Maybe she, maybe she's a hearing issue and she thought, you know, is also, I don't know what it was exactly. But I, my suspicion was that it was something that she said when she was nervous and giving a speech where she had the feeling that the audience felt she had treated the subject incompletely because she's because she's dumb and she didn't have anything in particular to say about it. She, so she delivered her line and there was no response to it. Nobody was applauding. Usually because in a debate, you know, they're more sedate about such things. Uh, and and so she would say, I don't have any more to say mentally, I think. I don't have anything else to add to this. But they clearly want more 
words about it, more observations to be made. So I'll say, also, at the end, and then maybe I'll throw in some other stuff, but then she forgot the other stuff or didn't have any of this. So she would just end the sentence and then say, also. Like, what? I don't even know what she was doing. I don't, I'm not sure why she was doing it. That's a guess. But she's just had a weird construction. But Trump's thing uh, ties up better in terms of syntax. Like, you can't just throw also at the end of the sentence. Even th- Sometimes it sounded like she was saying, I have another thought about this thing, and I'll say it. And then she'd express the thought, and then she'd say, you know, I never said also before, you know, as a preface to this other thought. So I'll just put it at the end here. Also, but Trump's... Tick is a little less obvious as a tick, although it isn't hard to pick out as a crutch that the, the, the fact that he keeps saying it is, believe me. One of the focus group members was like, oh, my God, every time he said, believe me, I almost, uh, you know, I, I almost threw up. I could, why? Because you can't. You can't believe him. And believe me is, I think, something that accompanies his phrases when he says something that I, he's a pretty, he's in, uh, a little intuitive about how people are generally. I mean, certain types of people. He thinks everyone loves his his BS and his screaming, yelling stuff, and they don't. But every once in a while, I think he gets the sense that he thinks the audience might think he's gone over the top on something, so he self-corrects with it. He says, believe me, he says it when he senses that you don't believe him or or possibly that you shouldn't believe him uh he just says believe me and and like you know these aren't the droids you're looking for these aren't the droids i'm looking for believe me i believe him that's what he does but the other thing he's got he's got a lot of physical ticks sort of you know or uh, typical moves i don't know if they're ticks or he doesn't really use them like crutches the way also or believe me Seems to be used, but you know he points and he thrusts and he jabs and stuff. But he he makes what's sort of like an okay sign, but it, you know what? It's it's very much like the little it's the finger pinch slash okay sign that uh, we see in that meme. The you know one does not simply walk into Mordor photo of uh, what's his name from the Lord of the Rings. So he speaks. And and he does the same sort of thing as he pinches in the ear and makes a semi like okay sign. He doesn't hold it up and spread the fingers out and you know and say okay. But he does that sort of that's his emphasis point. But I, I, did you notice? I mean, it's weird. I want I, you gotta watch the speech at home with somebody who's hearing impaired and see what happens. Because is he is that not? Is he not making, it seems like he is during his speech, constantly, <laughs> wink, wink, I'm uh, making the American Sign Language sign for, for, can, I think you can still, you can now say on the air, asshole. But I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope the a-hole, I usually go with that one. But since I'm describing the sign, I'm merely translating. It's not an anatomical reference in any sense. Uh, but, yeah, so I think that's, I think, uh, if Mr. Holland's opus is right, and I base my life on movies, as you know, old movies, but he just, it, what that must look like to somebody who actually understands sign language but can't hear the speech but then sees the closed captioning, and he's like, I'm going to, you know, exterminate this gender uh, group, or I'm going to make sure that uh, this uh, uh, religion is expelled from the United States constantly you know crime is terrible and boy do i hate black people and he's just making a little a-hole sign uh it's a tell we would say if he were playing poker which he doesn't because he doesn't have any casinos anymore anyway uh it was it was a crappy speech uh back to some of the observations that greg collected for us let's see uh james pedacocus i'm gonna guess (laughs) <laughs> at that pronunciation. Trump has described a dangerous, dark, there it is, dystopian America with which I am not familiar. That was the one thing that I found the pundits willing to say was, but although they did say it more in the context of, well, you're either going to love it or you hate it. it. Depends where you stand on this thing. Trump fans will love it and and Hillary fans are going to hate it. Well, 
sort of. It's a good starting point. But basically, they did. They were willing to concede that Trump was describing an America that a lot of people are not going to recognize, and that the people who do recognize it are wrong about thinking they recognize it. It's not really anything like what America is like. But for people who are literally afraid to go to a city, even if they're allowed to carry their concealed weapon when they go there. But I can't go to New York City to see the Empire State Building with my kids. I can't show them this great American icon because we'll all be raped and possibly murdered. We'll definitely be robbed. Probably be robbed in the elevator on the way to, you know. And cities aren't like that, guys. It's just not true. But they're certain that it is because they live in a rural land. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess people are raping and robbing them there all the time. So they figure it must only be worse in the cities where the population density is that much greater. And we'll just be raped and murdered with greater frequency. I guess the murder will only happen once. But the rapes can happen more often, I suppose. Uh, I don't really know what they think is going on in America, but... They seem convinced that they need to stay home in bunkers, heavily armed. And they're very worried that they'll be killed if they go to a city. That's who, if you, if you think that, it was an awesome speech. If you've been to a city and survived, it was a pretty dumb speech. All right. Michael Gerson. Another uh, observation, he is summoning primal forces of anger and fear, displaying leadership without moral guardrails, religious principles, or civic responsibility. The one moment uh, I did see pundits say, you know what, it was a speech also without any even attempts at humor or self-deprecation or anything. The, The hallmarks you usually occasionally see in... Uh, or you see occasionally displayed, scattered throughout. I mean, everybody does do that. You, you can't get up there and just be completely nuts and full of yourself, unless you're Donald Trump, and then he did do that. At one point, one self-deprecating moment that might have been interpreted as humor was when he thanked the evangelical community for backing him and said, I'm not totally sure I deserve it. That was actually a good one. That's a, that was a good line, a good self-deprecating, uh, moment and perfect for them. And that, you know, okay, well, there you go. See, he's humble. He's, he's, he's got humility before God. I'm not sure I deserve it. We're all sinners. Boo-hoo. So, okay. That, that was there. I'll take note of that. Uh, James Fallows, his observation, half this speech is the same old fear and mistrust. It was very much like, any of his stump speeches, I thought. But some little part, as delivered, is the first glimmer of the pivot. HRC, pay attention. Eh. Yeah, the first glimmer of the pivot. <clears throat> like I say, willing to say LGBTQ. And I'm not sure I deserve the support of evangelicals. But, uh, you know, but I do. Give me it anyway. John Favreau uh, observing... In response to James Fallows, yeah, I think he swamped all the good lines with fear and doom, and I'm not sure he can ever pivot away from that. Tegan Goddard, observing only that democracy is very fragile. Then Greg says, back to reality as we wait to see if media will normalize fascism. Noah Rothman saying, one thing this speech is definitely doing is alienating persuadable swing voters without a cultural chip on their shoulders. Yes, if you're not already angry... This speech wasn't going to make you join him in the anger, I don't think. It was only going to make you say, what a nut. Greg Sargent, the coverage of Trump's speech is actually quite brutal and pointed. Oh, that's good. I wish I was watching what he was watching. Widely uh, notes his red-faced ranting and authoritarian... Uh, widely notes? Is this a, a, was it widely noted? Or is there a person out there named you know Joe Widely? Is that, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm terrible with the names. Uh, noting the uh, red-faced ranting and authoritarian overtones. Yes. Oh, you know what? They really need to get is... I, so, I want to see the video of his face when Medea Benjamin interrupts the speech with a protest sign. Was a, the TV certainly made a bigger deal out of it than it had to be. I don't think she was quite that disruptive, 
But, but of course it was her. But okay, anyway, uh, uh, I was watching on NBC. They didn't identify her by name, but whoever was there was saying, I think that woman lives in Washington. I see her at a lot of protests. This is Code Pink. She was able to remember Code Pink, but uh, not that it was Medea Benjamin. But who knows whether I'm saying her name right anyway. So she might have had the same problem and just skipped doing the name. Anyway, excuse me there. Uh, yes, without Greg, I'm still sipping the coffee. So occasional brief pause for that. It's got to happen. Anyway, uh, where were we with this? Oh, yes. Oh, I wanted to see his face because at some point they gather her up, you know, and they're taking her out of the hall and everything's fine. And to that point, Trump had followed his coaching, which was clearly it was exactly, I think, as predicted yesterday on the show that there would be the chance of lock her up, lock her up, and there were, and that he would not join in it, and he would, you know, hold up his hand and say, you know, now, now, we don't do that in this country, and he was going to distance himself from that, and he did it. He did it exactly as predicted he did. In fact, hold the hands up and say, let's defeat her. You know, let's let's do it at the ballot box. We don't need to be with the lock her up, lock her up. And they that was fine. The crowd wasn't disappointed that he didn't say lock her up. He only joined in the USA, USA chance, which, by the way, when you do it, I wouldn't. Um, when you do it on the microphone alone by yourself over the roar of the crowd doing it, it sounds rather pathetic. But I, I'm sure he wanted to be heard saying USA, USA. But it, it doesn't sound good. Anyway. When they were throwing Medea Benjamin out, he did, in fact, scream something, I think, into the microphone, but I couldn't make out what it was. But anyway, his face really did get contorted, and he was screaming. He was, like, personally angered by this thing that he should have been above. They needed more coaching for him on that one. Let's see. Uh, Adam Nagorny says, a ton of emphasis in the speech on illegal immigration. A ton. No sign of him pivoting to the center. Bet many GOP leaders flipping out. Stuart Rothenberg. I haven't seen much movement. Race has been in the four to seven point range for a while. I don't believe every poll I see. Uh, this is in response to who? Uh, Andy Lawler, who says, uh, sadly, she hasn't had much to love with poll numbers. I guess that's uh, Hillary. Uh Rothenberg had originally said, what a week, plagiarism, Cruz, Trump, NATO, and Roger Ailes. Hillary must be loving it. Lawler says, sadly, she hasn't had much to love with poll numbers, except, you know, winning. But uh, other than that, you know, you must be pissed. Well, Stewart says, I haven't seen much movement. Race has been in the four to seven point range for a while. I don't believe every poll I see. Josh Barrow saying, when I read the text, I thought it would play. Or when I read the text, uh, the, the uh, advance copy of the planned text for the speech. When I read the text, I thought it would play. But since he's shouted the whole thing, aha, I think he's coming off as alarming in the wrong way. And then he later says, actually, I know why this speech seems so, so, so much more off-putting than normal. Usually Trump is funny, likable even, not today. That was missing. And then finally, David Graham in The Atlantic saying, Trump's speech was singularly and perhaps excessively focused on himself as a messianic figure. He did at some point say, of the system, you know, I have uh, I know the system, the, the tax and the money system is rigged. Oh, you know, no one knows it better than me, which is why only I can fix it. All uh, right, what did he say? I, you know, I'm the only one capable of it. I don't remember how he put it, but basically he did say exactly that. I'm the only one. Preceded by Evita's speech to make him look normal, says Greg. Note to self, she's the dangerous one after he loses. Oh, you think so? Hmm. That'd be interesting. All right, let's uh, <clears throat> skim down and uh, see what else we have. Oh, here's Armando, who will give me a chance to sip at the coffee. Let's let's welcome him on. Hey, good morning, Armando. Hey, good morning, David. Uh, uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm great. I'm good. <laughs> Do you have a voice left? I want to scream some more. He yeah, was I mean, pretty nutty. You know, I, I read that speech on paper. Yeah. And I don't know. I didn't react to it so viscerally when I read it. Maybe I should have. But when that, when that orange-faced tyrant 
read it, I, you know, it was repulsive and shocking to me. I don't know why seeing it read as opposed to just reading it on a piece of paper made that much of a difference to me, but it did. Yeah, you can really drive it home if you, I mean, I don't, who, I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by this. I should ask, among the people who read the speech in advance, there's not that many, I assume, but some people did it. Did you scream it in your mind, or did it even occur to you the possibility that he was going to shout every word of it? No one's it did done not. That. You know, I, I, my, I, I violated Godwin and said he shouted every line of his speech. You know, yeah. you know like well, Hitler. Yes, but I, you know, I wonder whether uh, I'm sure he must have practiced it. I he wonder whether he yelled the shouting? it. I wonder. Well, I'm wondering whether he practiced the speech with the shouting. And maybe somebody said, hmm, it's evocative of Hitler. You shouldn't do that. Um, so the, the ultra sophisticated 11 dimensional chess version of the deliberations beforehand probably goes something like, well, Godwin's law being what it is, nobody wants to hear, they're sick and tired of them comparing you to Hitler. The networks are never going to do it in a million years. So go for it, and then when people do compare you to Hitler, you say, oh, they're a bunch of shrill liberals. They compare everybody to Hitler. Enough with the Hitler stuff already. Why do you love Hitler so much? And uh, we'll get away with it. And well, then, I'm uh, not the guy with my comp book uh, on my <laughs> bedside. But right. Okay. Well, there is that. Yes. Um, yeah, otherwise, it's just, I don't know, let Trump be Trump. Or, or maybe it was just, uh, yeah, in the read-throughs, he spoke it and then the adrenaline got the better of him and he's just not that well coached i mean that happens to people you see it in sports all the time you know uh, just put a little bit too much on every shot because of the adrenaline and you got to learn to back off and uh it's loud out there and he yeah i mean i get all that but every single line yeah I, I, i you have to guess that they coached him not to do that but that he just he just did it anyway because he's because he's nuts and that's what shouty. his whole thing is. yeah and that he's a bully and he screams at people and his whole appeal as something different is well people don't shout their speeches and I'm sick I'm sure a lot of people are I'm sick and tired of these milk toast politicians sure they you know they say they mouth the right words but they don't sound like they feel it they think they're saying it because a focus test told them and it would excite me but it doesn't seem to excite them. So I yeah, don't believe I've, in him. I've been one who's been resistant to the whole Hillary shouts too much thing mm-hmm. because I do think it's sexist. But as pure political strategy tactics here, she really has to avoid shouting anything. I think it would be a tremendous contrast to sound like a rational human being in your voice tone. Uh, so I, I think that they should really make a real effort to avoid the shouting. They certainly will, and she's certainly better practiced at it. The only places I've ever seen her approach shouting is, you know, to to squeeze in the, you know, thank you, uh, Los Angeles, on her way out the door, but the crowd is going crazy, and, you know, or she needs to acknowledge somebody or deliver the big applause line over a rising roar, she will raise her voice, but never like this. Yeah, I, I, that, that's absolutely true. My, you know, I I think, the one thing that I, I just grabbed this reaction in myself this morning, it, it felt like 75 minutes of the Willie Horton ad uh, mm. to me. Interesting, yeah. It was unrelentingly, you know, these non-white people are scary, dangerous. They're, uh, the, they've made our world dangerous. They've ruined our world. Um, again, I'm going to go Godwin. I imagine that's what Hitler sounded like in Germany in, 30, in the 30s. I guess so. I mean, like, like I've said a million times, he's got this apocalyptic view of the United States that just doesn't match anything anybody's ever seen. I guess if you have a panic room, you know, and, and who has panic rooms? People like you're him. a militia in right. Idaho That's or essentially something. like having you a know, panic room. You know, it's right room. up your wheelhouse. you got a bunker. You have a cache of weapons as a hedge against the tyrannical government or being overrun by foreign hordes, possibly, or a yeah. panic room. Like, you know, and I mean, a guy like him probably has got to have stuff like that. I suppose, you know, there's a pretty serious danger 
back in the day, anyway, before Secret Service protection, that, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s, would somebody have pl- hatched a plot to, you know, snatch Ivanka, kidnap her for a billion dollar payoff? Or something? Sure. So, but for the rest of us, yeah, and, and, you know, if you can solve it with private jets, limos, personal bodyguards, and panic rooms, uh, then there's no problem. You're living a great life. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the weirdest thing is how a guy who was born rich, Mm -hmm. had everything handed to him, basically screwed it up, but somehow was able to survive by pretending to be a rich guy and having people pay him for pretending to be a rich guy. stealing everything. Can be angry about anything. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, he had to pay 30% on some of his contracts, and that pisses him off. (laughs) He's angry. Paid the mafia? Uh, No. To the uh, contractors, uh, you know, people who uh, built Taj Mahal. Well, uh, yeah, Taj you want a hundred thousand dollars for that one. I'll give you three thousand because it was shoddy workmanship. Or what? Yeah, you know, so all the contractors and small business people he ripped off. Have you seen, by the way, the the ads? I don't know, is it the Hillary campaign putting them out, or maybe one of the super PACs that put together these fantastic series of videos of small business contractors who've yeah. been ripped off by him. It yep. really is amazing. But they don't yep. scream. Maybe He's, we should try one with a screamer. That guy's I mean, a it, dick. It, that would be great. <laughs> everything is so bizarre about this that it's... Uh, I don't even know what to say. I mean, literally, it's all hate and white anger. Mm-hmm. And it has no thousand points of light or no shining city on the hill. No morning in America. You know, the, right. The, all of torches. that used to be leavened with something else. Right. But this is the pure stuff. Take it raw. Yeah. Well, we have an opioid problem in the country, and people wanted to mainline his anger, I guess. Ezra Klein, I note here, with a piece here in a segment of uh, Greg's Roundup, Donald Trump's nomination is the first time American politics has left me truly afraid. That was before the speech. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, that's pretty amazing. Of course, the alt-right uh, people with the frog cartoon guy are like, fantastic. That's a triumph that uh, the, the, the Jewish journalists are afraid at last that we're going to snatch them in the middle of the night and murder them, which is smart. No, you can't say those Jews aren't smart. We are going to snatch them in the middle of the night and murder them. But, you know, it, it, good on yeah. him for recognizing it. It, it's interesting. I'll give you a, a, a reaction that maybe you haven't found in the pundit roundup. Okay. Uh, and I had it yet last night, but after seeing that speech, I'm more convinced that than ever that that uh, Elizabeth Warren would be the right choice for this mm. election for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you you got to take this bully off. I mean, yeah. is Tim Kaine going to do that? I just I don't think he has it in him. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I hope so, because I'm afraid we may get Because it's probably going to be Tim Kaine, right? So, I, I don't get it. It would uh, be exciting uh, to find out he did. But, uh, you know, that it's going to be what it's going to be, and it's almost certainly not going to be Warren, but uh, I think that's a mistake. I think that, uh, you know, the this, this white, vanilla, boring... Guy, I mean, and nothing against Tim Kaine. I'm sure he's a great public servant. He might even be a great president someday, but he's not a great politician. You know what I mean? There's nothing about him that excites me. I mean, he has surprised me a couple times in the last few months with in, in a positive way, and he's surprised me in some negative ways as well. Um, well, not surprising, I guess. He has the other the complaints over the past couple of days about here he is positioning himself for VP, and he's saying, you know, well, we got to get off the backs of the banks here. Yeah, that was that was what? very jarring. I, I, someone, if he really was going to be VP, just said, listen, why don't you not make that statement this time? Yeah, wait for a clue, you know, from, and then maybe that was it. And Hillary was, a lot of, certainly a lot of Sanders supporters will say, well, it was Hillary saying I need somebody else to carry the bank message. I can't you know, do it right I now. mean, unfortunately, that's not an implausible thing to, to the yeah. surmise. I mean, what was he doing? Why would he make that statement? I don't know. Uh, certainly, it seemed more Mark Warner than Tim Kaine, typically I speaking. I mean, I, I honestly don't know what his positions are on all those things. I don't know either. But, Maybe and, and, and I think he's wrong on the merits. I mean, it's, uh, but I think just more importantly, it's just bad politics. 
Uh, yeah, yeah and depending it's on what politics that, that, he's playing. That he didn't realize it was bad politics at this particular time. Yeah. I, well, that that's what makes me wonder whether it, whether it was. Well, it's bad politics as between me and the electorate. But right now, the politics I'm playing is between me and Hillary. I, and she says, I need to, I mean, this, like I said, this is surmise here. I need to shore up the finance community Why? here i don't know it, somebody yeah. told her that uh, they might go with trump because he's gonna you know let him run wild and you need to show that uh, you understand a more balanced approach but you're not totally anti-bank or whatever don't let don't let your don't let sanders message become yours or you'll scare them into the trump camp as somebody there's one thing there's her. one thing to not adopt Whole hog, the Sanders message, and I have some problems with the Sanders message. There's a little on bit policy. of room between his Zen message and Trump's. Yes, <laughs> but there's some light, something or nothing. How about just a blank slate for one? Yeah, why, I, I don't I, see why. Wall was, it, was it really necessary for him to be on that letter? I mean, it's, no, I would say not. And yeah, I wish I was in the room. Unless somebody tell him, "Go ahead, you're not going to be the pick anyway." So, oh, you know, well, kiss then anybody's I don't know what butt. the hell he's doing. Maybe he's just yeah. Well, maybe I'll raise some money for myself. I'll I'll try this. Yeah, program. that's fine too. But I guess that's uh, fine, not if he's going to be the VP. It's it's yeah. now going to be a story. It's going to be a big to do. People are going to be upset, and you know they weren't particularly pleased with him in the first place. Yeah. Well, I don't like it, but like I, I the only thing I can think of is if if word comes from the Hillary camp. You know, a really good show of loyalty right now would be to do the work that I need done with the finance community but can't do myself. And if you'll show me that, you know, I don't know. What the hell do well, I, I mean, then the Hiller camp has some idiots in it, they, which is which do. is they distressing. <laughs> That's that Everybody's got their share of idiots. Uh, I wish it wasn't on finance in particular, but it's... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I mean, really, what's wrong with leaving Wall Street scratching their head and guessing? You know what? I trust that, uh, the bulk of the finance community in a, in looking at, let's default on the debt, let's pull out of NATO, let's nuke everybody indiscriminately, let's, uh, murder ethnic groups and exclude people based on religion, and we'll say, that's a destabilizing force, and I don't like destabilizing forces because my money. And, uh, yeah, I like the idea of a tax cut from him. But, you know, what good is a tax cut if the world is on fire? Okay. Uh, I don't love Hillary, but, you know, she's from New York. She's all right. She'll be okay. She understands what Wall Street does and doesn't absolutely need in order to function so uh, we'll go. You know, I, I I'll trust them to make the right choice, mostly there. Well, because or they not? Can't. Or don't trust us. I mean, we're not going to win the election with Wall Street. I mean, and if she needed money, I think someone made a good point uh, yesterday. I think it was Brooklyn Bad Boy. Then you pick Warren, who's going to give. Hmm. There'll be a lot of uh, excitement, a lot of grassroots excitement, and and donations that come with a Warren uh, pick. I'm sorry, Dave. I had yeah. a call come in, and oh. then I so I missed your last statement. Oh, just was it your guess that uh, a a Warren pick would excite the small donor base? Yeah, she yeah. has a huge small donor base. Not Bernie sized at this point, but but pretty darn good. I mean, if what if we're worried about a hundred million dollars from Wall Street, which is I guess the implied surmise of why you have to be nice to Wall Street, why not replace that with a hundred million dollars of Warren small donors? Um, uh, America. I don't know. I got nothing. I, I think it's old thinking. It's troubling, yeah. and uh, it, it's it's a setback in my view. I really do think that. Well, we're uh, not done yet. I, I, I'm someone who would have said neutral on Kane. I don't think he's the right pick because you're missing an opportunity, but not too negative. But that statement that came out. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it makes him kind of negative. There's a there's a there's a negative now with Kane, and I I think he's the wrong choice. Not only that, you know the whole dynamics of the Senate. Okay, yeah. sure, McAuliffe picks his replacement, but his replacement's up for reelection on November seventeenth, uh, November two thousand seventeen. Hmm. So we get ten months. We're going to trade the, the – and then who's going to hold that seat? The replacement? Is McAuliffe going to decide not to run for governor? I mean, it's – oh, well, he can't run for governor. You're right. <clears throat> mm. 
and then you got to run in 2018 again. I think uh, I think every there's everything is wrong about Tim K as the pick here. There's it, it doesn't make any sense to me. As I said, if you really want Tim Kane, just pick Vilsack and, and be done with it. Mm-hmm. And he didn't make a stupid statement about banks. Okay. True. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I uh, I have no advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> at this I, point, I who complaints. cares what our advice is? It right. is what it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we'll go fight as hard as we can with what we got. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know. Okay. Well, uh, we'll wait to see. And uh, convention starts and couple of days and i guess yeah i guess the excitement today for from our side is is she gonna name her vp today or is she gonna wait till saturday or sunday or whatever yeah, i wonder yeah normally uh, uh well i know your routine i would wait till the weekend Fridays, if it's gonna be kane so. or whoever i mean no one's gonna care i mean yeah it'll get it'll get lost in trump uh, trump will lose it today uh unless you have somebody exciting to pick I, I think there's two people that would qualify for an announcement today warren of course mm-hmm. or uh, my person that I would pick if I could convince him is Joe Biden. I really would. <laughs> that it would be a tough thing to, but that would be. Well, I'll tell you what. Even if you don't particularly either care for Joe Biden, which I don't know that many people who really are like, boy, do I hate Joe Biden. No, but, uh, the media loves Joe Biden. Yeah, that that would just be so extraordinary. Wouldn't it by itself? Just by itself, it's a huge story. Yeah, that's true. It really would be. I mean, because and what a speech it could be too, right? Joe Biden getting up there and say, "You know, I wasn't going to do this," and I, if you had asked me, yeah, I would have said, "Never in a million years would I do this again. Never. Ne- you would have to. Can you? You can't even imagine how imperiled America itself would have to be to get me to do this again." Yes, Hillary came but, to me and said, "Your country needs you." Yeah, I mean, what the, a speech the threat it could be. we face now is this is nutcase huge. running for president as a Republican, supposedly. And, of all right. things, I couldn't, I could not turn my back. Wow, exactly, it's bana- a great I, I setup. Just, I just, I just voted. Holy cow! <laughs> I, I tell you, it's it, it's a great setup, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really. Mm, Man, see now, well, now you're willing to, argue willing to give some advice now, right? <laughs> well, that would be a great speech, and I could. Ne- I I have been hesitant to you know to to advocate that because it seems like wow, that's a hell of a long shot. But that's what it would make. It would be hell of a hell of a news day, and no one could say he's not qualified right. or he's risky. Yeah, gee, or I don't like know. That. He's a, a kind of bit of an unknown. <laughs> no, none of that works. 16 you know, years as steady, vice president. No one has ever done uh, that. It's steady, uh, yet exciting and uh, unprecedented, and really underlines the stakes mm-hmm. of this election. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to me, it's a no-brainer if he would do it. But maybe he won't do it. You know, maybe yeah, he says, you know what? Sell. I'm tired of this. I'm I, I'm pissed that I'm not going to be president, and yeah, I'm yeah. not doing it. That's I mean, very difficult. Yeah, I agree. Listen, it's a huge. It would be a service to his country in a way that uh, that has not not been asked of anyone. Um, <clears throat> it would be admirable of Joe Biden to do it, yes. <laughs> but you know, I think it's all fantasy stuff anyway. Uh, I think uh, there's a certain pridefulness in Hillary's camp here that they're going to do it their way. Yeah, and so I think that's what they're going to do, and that's okay. why I think we'll probably get Kane. Yeah, and I think that's a mistake. It would be pretty cool, though. That I'm just thinking about that speech and the things I'm that you, Biden see? is willing to say that other people aren't. I mean, boy, is that guy out of you know f's to give on this stuff? I mean, the speech could be very inspirational, but it also could be you know Biden funny. We already all had the, all our stuff in the house. In Biden speech, want to pack that it could up. be a great speech. I mean, that's a great <laughs> Biden speak speech. Yeah. Hmm. All right. I, it's I'm listen, running for you know, I mean, I, I, I've, I've thought this for a while. I think it even more after last night. But uh, they're going to do what they do, and we'll just put our heads down and go to work. I mean, there's nothing else to do. I got to so. stop this guy. Yeah. This is a real calamity staring us in the face. How about she picks him? She doesn't announce pre-convention. And, then and he just shows up. Boom. Wow. <laughs> and he's lowered from a helicopter on a wire and... Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways you could really showmanship it. No question <laughs> about it. But uh, you know, he comes uh, out in a Trump wig and then goes, <laughs> whips it off. Damn! No, I'm the anti-Trump. Right. He arrives. He, oh, and he arrives in Philly by by train by Amtrak. It's perfect. I, I mean, I think it, it it checks all the cane boxes and does so much, much more. And, uh, oh, he, it's and just he can come in not, and just be like, "I was in the neighborhood." Da, da, da. <laughs> So I thought yeah, I'd come but it's in gonna and run be, for vice president. But it's going to be Tim Kaine. You know, they're going to have him go out there and speak Spanish, which I'm so against. Oh. In his first appearance. Is that right? Doing that pander. It's, it, it doesn't work. It's, I think it's a huge mistake. I hope somebody in the campaign says, you know, that's so patronizing. Like in a mm. normal setting, you know what you should do? Mm. If you're going to pick Kane. Yeah. Okay. Let him go do an interview with Jorge Ramos in Spanish. That's how you do it. You do it as a natural thing, right? That would be something. That's how do you that? do this. Yeah. Oh, look, he speaks Spanish thing. Because he yes. does. He speaks perfect Spanish. He's, well, then. he's very accomplished. Then I would, in, yeah. I would in definitely that way. do that. But you can't force it. you got to let it happen in a natural setting. And there's no more natural setting than having his first national yes. uh, interview be with, say, Jorge Unless Ramos he comes of Univision. Out and in Spanish says, now at this point I was going to break out the Spanish – but I know that can be very patronizing. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to con- I'm going to pledge here now to an interview in Spanish with Jorge Ramos. Where you can test me there. Anybody can write a speech and put it on a teleprompter and read it in Spanish. You, no, I'll wait what, you, what you need him to do is first interview right after the announcement and Without the big event. Doing it, okay? Is with Jorge Ramos. It's easy. Yeah. Okay. In my opinion, it's easy. But well, we, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, it should be Biden. That'd be funny. It really he can be. speak in Spanish. So he, <laughs> he, he doesn't. <laughs> I don't think he speaks Spanish. But the, that Biden, that's not what what picking Biden would be about. Right. Yeah. See, the thing with Kane is you're looking for. Oh well, he speaks. You know, they're they're talking about his why Kane because he speaks Spanish. Ah. That was it. Well, that's what. I, what else do they tell you? I don't know. Oh, he's from Virginia. Oh. And, uh, he's got executive experience. He's True. a one term governor. The, the funniest is he's got foreign relations experience. He just got on the Senate in 2012. Hmm. And he's the, the, you know, the guy at the end of the table on the foreign relations committee. Come on. That's not a cell of foreign relations experience. Hmm. Now, of course, they're talking about this admiral guy, but I can't believe that's even a possibility myself, but who <clears throat> knows? That's, uh, yes. Uh, I I'm, would like them to be really damn sure <laughs> that this is going to work. I, I'm against it simply because well, I, I, I don't know what does he stand for. Who knows where he stands on anything? Right. He likes the ocean. That's good. Yeah. I, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, he's, he's he's a military man. Yes. Great. I mean, you yeah. know, I, I mean, there's a better argument for West Clark. Uh, West Clark has done so much lobbying and whatnot. He's basically out of that. But uh, at least you know he ran a campaign and he enunciated positions right. that you can point to. Uh, this is. Uh, I just don't. I, I personally don't think that's yeah, going to happen right. anyway. No, I think it's going to be Kane. Uh, you know, you have a joint chiefs. Get catch yourself all the advice you want. Pick yeah, your, exactly. Pick your joint chiefs wisely, uh, and and leave it at that. We don't need don't need to transfer military into the executive as well. I mean, it's great as background, but they can't be all there is to it. Right. Well, totally agree with you. This is uh, it was it was some day, and I I believe Biden is the cure for what ails us here. That would be a hell of a weekend, and a hell of I a agree. week next week. And and no one can get upset about it. You can't you know you can say well because listen it's a sitting VP. Yeah, you know no one could question that choice from any perspective. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, if you do, it's because you hate Obama. And guess what? We're yeah. not going to get very many Obama haters uh, voting for us that's, anyway. That's true too. I mean, you know, I understand all, all the counters to it, and uh, I'm, I'm only looking on the bright side, surely. But uh, it certainly would be – It uh, you can't deny that it would be the biggest news she could make. Absolutely. With this pick. Even bigger than Warren, I would agree. Yeah. All right. Other than Obama or Bill. <laughs> or Michelle. Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously Obama's not doing it. 
I, I think we've all determined the Constitution does permit that, but how does yeah. a sitting president run to be vice president? Well, I think Putin did that in Russia, though. <laughs> that's, I think he that's did. That's not good. <laughs> but yeah, I think he may have uh, he may have done that. He put in his puppet, and he was the VP. And I think, I, I think literally the puppet right. resigned. Was with him. Putin again? became the premier again, or the president. Yeah, I can't even remember the guy's name. M. Yeah, there was some guy, uh, literally some guy. Yeah. Uh, and I think the guy stayed uh, as the puppet for a year, and then he just resigned, and Putin became president again. <laughs> Maybe he didn't even resign. Just Putin just started taking over the press conference. He wrote him like a pony. That's true. Maybe it was not even a piece of paper. Uh, well, yeah, you all know I'm really the president, so here I am. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it was. It, it really, it really would make a lot of news. Uh, that's for sure. And uh, if you're going to do it over the weekend, and I guess they are. Yeah, they got to do it over the weekend. Then uh, that's a breakthrough piece. I mean, they could do it today, but the, you yes. do it before Monday. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you definitely do it before Monday. I think they're looking at Saturday, uh, realistically. Again, if it's Tim Kaine, you need a little distance from Trump because nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get some coverage out of it, you do it Saturday, maybe Sunday. And then you go hold your convention and hope and do the best you can. Yeah. Pick Ivanka. That is Really How about that head. Ivanka speech? That, Good uh, speech. At first, I thought it was a little cardboard, but yeah. later... When she got into specifics, it became more appealing, and yet, well, as everybody it said, it has nothing speech. to do with what her actual, yeah. what her father actually espouses. Oh, free child care we're going to have. And, right, um, equal pay. Babysitting at the work. Lily yes. Ledbetter. Yeah. You know, I mean, when has a Republican ever celebrated Lily Ledbetter? I mean, come on. Never, of course. Never. Would never um, and they won't pass it for him, and it's not happening. But so, you know, when he builds it, a building, it, it, boy... It, and I was slightly worried uh, about it when I said, well, you know what? Maybe Trump's going to do a real pivot. Yeah. But, of course, he didn't. So Ivanka's speech was just jarringly out of place. It, yeah. It was a good speech. And but, I would have welcomed it at a Democratic But it had nothing perhaps. to do with anything else that happened right. in the Republican convention. She's not able to or interested in, perhaps, carrying that message of fear. I mean, she's she's... Young, she's urban oriented too. She can't, she can't deliver the speech. I'm afraid to go out because she's all about going out. Well, here's a very cynical ploy, a cynical pl uh, take. Yeah, Ivanka has her own brand. She really so, does. Yeah. And to play to that convention with what they were doing and what with her what her father did would have ruined her brand. Yes, well, you can't sell, you know, strappy sandals with... Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm talking about just her public persona, you know. Yeah, okay. She is truly the most celebrated person in this campaign right now. Certainly in, in that family, yeah. I, and by, by the media, I mean. And, yeah, by uh, Donald. You know, no one Mine says a bad himself. word about her. And she said not a bad word about anybody. How can you fault a daughter for thinking well of her father? You really you can't, not. can you? No, and they were counting on that, and... And I think that was the normal reaction. Even in the focus group that I saw, you know, uh, the the conservative, I think probably conservative-leaning woman, the, the only, well, you could tell by the way she put it, she, well, she respects her father, and that's good. Well, it's more than that. She, You know, it's her dad. She loves it's her It's her dad. I mean, you can't fault somebody for, no. for, for that. I mean, you can't. Of course, what she talked about had nothing to do with her dad's policies. Which was fascinating. But, uh, you know, and then, again, if her father had even just nodded at what Ivanka was talking about a little mm -hmm. bit, it would have been an interesting play. But, I mean, to me, by the yeah. time he was 30 minutes into his speech, Ivanka was not what I was thinking about. Right. That's true. It was all blotted out until, unless you were thinking, boy, I wish it was more like what she did. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, I have a I have a perverse sense of humor, and I watch this show called Archer, <coughs> and there's this character has Barry, and he has an other Barry, and I thought of, well, there's Trump, and then there's Ivanka's other Trump, who no one's ever seen except her. Hmm. Yeah. You don't watch if you watch Archer, you'd know what I'm talking about, but you don't. So at any right. rate, the <laughs> the the idea is that the, that that's a Trump that nobody knows except her, and that 
really doesn't help the rest of us. Not much. Uh, and also, it uh, it's not it doesn't apply to the campaign. So he's not running for national dad. He's not going to take care of all of us. He's not going to, you know. He's not going to give us all foundations. Right. So, yeah. Uh, but I thought she did a good one. I thought she, and she was measured enough and smart enough to say things like, well, you know, he's going to fight for uh, child care and the things that working women need to succeed. I know as a working mom how hard it is. And then immediately, thank God for her, follows up with, and I know you know, I'm way more privileged than most, yeah. but no, it was, yeah, I mean, for, for Ivanka, that was a good, a yeah. very good speech. When your kids are, at when, home, when she runs for home. office, she has a heck of a chance. Yeah. Uh, even as a Democrat, I think she'd have a very yeah. good chance. She had uh, a fine uh, platform uh, for that stuff. If that's something she wants to do. I thought uh, it was very transparent the way there was a very telling audience reaction, sort of like, you know, mild applause for yeah, childcare and, a little bit yeah. of that. I think even in Trump's speech, in his own thing, where he's like, we're going to be, a, what did he say, generous and warm country? And it was kind of like cricket, cricket, cricket. But we're going to kick the crap out of some immigrants, too. <sighs> yeah, I mean, why even drop that line in there? It's just... Uh... So that people said, you know, look, he's pivoting. But it, no, it didn't take. It didn't take. You can't You can't have 75 minutes of bile and hate. And... Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I was struck by the white pundit, some white pundit reaction to it, and, 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 I, and I, I know that sounds dero- you know, <laughs> dismissive and derogatory. And, oh, you're just you're saying the real racist. every white people doesn't. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying oh, that okay. we all have different mindsets, different perspectives. We come from it from a different place. We simply do. You know, a guy like Matthew Dowd, who tries to be an honorable person. Talks about it. he understands the media least not getting Trump because uh, I could see why this appeals. And the reason he sees why this appeals, there's a little bit of Trump in him. He's a white guy who feels like some things are getting taken away from him, mm-hmm. and that's a little scary. And that's the white perspective. Now, but they, but what they don't do is consider the non-white perspective to that speech. And you look at the non-white pundit class, and frankly, I think it would trickles down to everybody. It was a scary, scary, scary speech. Yeah. Even, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's what Van Jones was, uh, responding with. And Van on was right. And he was right. And, boy, and Anna Navarro he, was right. Levan- and it shows. Lewandowski want to kill him. When you're not this white person, yeah. it sounds different to you. It sounded different to me. Now, you know, Dave, you know me, you know, I, I could pass for white, but I know where I come from. Hmm. And I know what how I was raised. And I know what I faced. It just sounds different to us. Maybe we're not being fair to Trump, or maybe we're not being fair to the pundits. But it sounds different to us. Mm-hmm. Why your optics don't count? I have no idea. And they don't take that into account at all. Reagan Democrats is all they think about. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a traditional thing where you know you could win an election area. Demographically, we're learning. That is increasingly untrue, and we're on right on the verge of that moment where it just isn't true anymore. And this may be the election where where we have to break with that. After all, and we were due to break with it, no matter who the candidate was. So I don't know. Maybe they'll and hope. I guess the best thing we could take out of it is they could lay the crushing defeat at the uh, feet of Trump himself. And enter 2020 saying, we're going to go for those Reagan Democrats and then lose again. And then maybe at some point they'll say, maybe there aren't as many of them as there are of other people. Yeah, well, that was 2012 and they didn't run a Trump like campaign that year. Right. Uh, so 2016, uh, that campaign, I, w- I hope, I pray, can't succeed, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. The other thing I would point to out uh, about last night is uh, there was really no argument about uh, Trump's competence, fitness mm-hmm. for office. Uh, it was about message. Yeah. And I think that the, the one, I think you lay out a positive uh, vision on message that contrasts with what Trump did. 
But I do think you go hard negative on him on the fitness for office and the competence issue. They've done it in their ads. Mm -hmm. But there's got to be a night of Trump is just crazy and unfit uh, for the office. Not even about the message, just that he's a ignorant buffoon. And the NATO thing is a great entryway to that. But there's 8 million other things. Mm -hmm. And I think someone uh, someone of stature will need to do that. Uh, not, you know, not just one of those little five minute speeches yeah. that, you know, you have 50 of those. You need one of the cornerstone feature speeches to be a true indictment of Trump as a competent person, the as Biden someone who's not speech. fit to be president. The Biden acceptance speech will do nicely. Biden acceptance speech would be the perfect yeah. vehicle for that. All right. I don't need to actually introduce myself to you. You don't need a soft focus video about where I came from. You know this. If you want it, take a look back in 2008. It's there. Right. Uh, and then, you know, Obama can be the character <laughs> witness for Hillary and talk about how great she is and let Biden tell us how awful Trump is. Yeah. It's and perfect. Elizabeth it's right Warren, there. It's laid out for you. Now, Bobby Moak, just do it. No, th- no need to thank us. Yeah. Right, although, you know, I don't know, pizza would be cool. Something. <laughs> Send us a pizza. It will be Pitcher good. Pitcher of beer. I don't know. Uh, right. And we, we, we'll come to Philly. Uh, I'm not eating the, I'm not eating cheese whiz. But, uh, uh, are you going to Philly? I'm going to no. be there Monday. Are you? Uh, I'm yeah. not, I have no plans to go there uh, and nowhere to nowhere to stay if I do. Well, so. I'm just driving in and driving back. Yeah. Uh, from, from New York. So it's uh, an idea. An idea. I'm just, I've got ideas, uh, some souvenirs. Some things to to go people to go see on Monday, and mm. uh, if uh, I'm I'm trying to finagle a pass to get into the convention okay. on Monday night, I have a probably a fifty fifty chance. And if I do, I'll come back and report to you on yeah. Tuesday on how it went. Do that. Pitch him the show, something like that. I don't know. Something. <laughs> I will. I oh, am yeah, actually. That's my press pass. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Haley Coast K Girl of the Morning uh, correspondent. My kids are finally willing to acknowledge that I have a show now that I've put it on YouTube. <laughs> so All right. See, like, I told you guys, YouTube. I'm glad to see that. Yeah. Well, I got to figure out some way of putting some visual to it. That yeah, we need a little videos. video, but I don't. We've all we've you know you and I have cracked our heads on that one. We got to figure that one out. Yeah. The answer but, is uh, in but Philly. But we will. We will. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, All right. Yeah, let me and let you back to your, to your regularly scheduled programming. Sure. Then. Thanks for letting me vent a little. All right. Uh, yeah, next week we'll rely on it. We'll love a report on Tuesday. Uh, tell us about the souvenirs that are available. Maybe I'll drive That's up right. and buy some shirts and pins and stuff. Uh, I, I will I will, uh, I will. send you some visuals. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Take some pictures on your phone and tell me what the funny stuff is. All right. Very will good. do. Thanks oh, wait. So one last thing. Yes. Did. You remember when I went to the Trump rally yes. in Florida? Mm-hmm. One of the speakers was the speechwriter for Trump last night, a guy named Stephen Miller, who worked for Sessions for many oh, he years. Spoke. And if you've seen the, the, you should look at the profiles on that guy. Yeah. The, you know, that, that speech was as much this Miller Sessions guy hmm. of fear for white people, for hatred of non-white people. Jeff Sessions? Is that your, uh, yeah, the guy's name was Stephen Miller. He was a yeah. longtime aide to Jeff Sessions. Yes, yes. I and uh, it's not surprising if you think about it with uh, that that speech came out last night hmm. it, without any of the I don't see it but uh, you know the people I know he, he he comes across more fun and loose at these rallies than he did last night last night was it was all the anger yeah. without leavened with any charm without any uh, looseness. Believe me, um, it was something else. So that it was really that, that dystopian vision is is as much Stephen Miller's as Donald mm. Trump's. Okay, so it, it's worth worth taking a look at that guy. Uh, I will. Uh, yeah, he was mentioned to me. I was just chatting a little bit about him last night with uh, with John Aravosis, actually. Uh, so interesting take I got. We'll have to read up on him and pay some attention. He looks like a interesting fellow. Yes, he's he's uh, he, he he was from California, I believe San Diego, mm-hmm. and he was like in the you know white Aryans. Cl- I'm huh. I'm completely going over the top, but the equivalent of you know protect our heritage type uh, movement in high school. Uh-huh. He learned to hate non-whites in high school. There's a great story. I'd need to find it. This is a prison. So you high can school? talk to 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 about it. 
at some point because okay. it, it's a pretty scary guy. And I, and I think it who, who who that guy portrayed in that article and who I saw was hmm. pretty much what was represented and what was reflected in that speech. I have a yeah, I got a, a well, I got an article on him at some point from him, and uh, I'll have to I'll bring that up. Yeah, it's worth okay. it's worth exploring, I believe. Anyway, I will let you go now. Have a good weekend, um, and I'll <laughs> be reporting back to you on Tuesday. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, well, have a great right. time, and uh, say hello to, I don't know, Liberty Bell and uh, Adam Bonin, I guess. <laughs> okay, will do. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Uh, take a little Robitussin, too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what happened at the end there, but okay. Uh, where was this thing? Let me see if I can look up that... Uh, Stephen Miller uh, article, just kind of put it aside maybe uh, or read it over the weekend. I I don't remember exactly which one I saw. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, Stephen Miller profile, the believer in Politico magazine. So we'll put that one aside. He's he, he reminds me of somebody I don't know, like a cross between the guy who was like the weird guy with the sharp pointy sideburns from Freedom Works during the uh, during the Dick Army armed takeover days and the agent from The Matrix. He's, a, <laughs> he's got a little mix going on there. Uh, weird guy. Anyway. Um, I'll put that one aside, I guess, and I'll get to some other topics. Um, let me see. There are some things that I definitely wanted to toss out there. Like, for instance, I guess before I totally shift gears, uh, Kate Sherrill had, uh, or I'm sorry, Rosalind McGregor had, in fact, sent me this piece from Vox. And it's always worth looking at Vox. Vox is going to explain to me uh, all the things that went on last night. Because that's what they do. Three winners and three losers. Losers from the fourth night of the Republican National Trash Fire. Uh, Dylan Matthews on the piece for this one. Uh, I guess we should just get... Um, maybe we'll just run down the list. Because, I mean, what's it going to say? It's going to say it was a speech full of uh, hatred and fear, right? As a matter of fact, the big winner. Number one winner, fear. Fear. Uh, illustrated with a photo of a woman holding up a sign that said, Trump is America's great ball of fire. I don't even know what, why is that good? Again, though, the celebration of anger. Hooray for anger, all of a sudden, now that a white Republican guy has it. Boo for everybody else's anger. It, it's like the only legitimate anger somehow, even though it's like, yeah, God damn it, it's our turn. No wonder we're angry. We, it's all, we're always deferring to you. You've won everything. We don't win anymore. We win everything. You win everything. But you're angry. Anyway, uh, uh, we'll take a quick look. Uh, the write-up about the fear. It's hard to know where to start with Trump's speech, but this paragraph is what I keep coming back to. I have a message for all of you. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon come to an end. Oh yes, that was it too. A lot of fast stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna defeat ISIS fast. That was it. Soon come to an end. Beginning on January 20th, 2017, safety will be restored. This is not something a presidential contender says in real life. This is something a president elect in a particularly unsu- unsubtle dystopian young adult novel about the danger of trading liberty for security says. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation is not the problem Trump thinks it is. Violent crime has plummeted dramatically in recent decades. America has more or less never been safer. And all true. But do we need this much more about fear? Another winner of the night, Plutocracy, illustrated by, my goodness, a bald gentleman that appears overly leathery. This is who? Billionaire Tom Barrack addressing the convention and and you'll never believe it blue suit white shirt red tie who would have thunk it uh tonight featured speeches from three billionaires trump well two billionaires and trump uh also paypal co-founder and venture capitalist peter thiel who became famous by getting upset at gawker and real estate investor tom barrick they followed in the footsteps of casino billionaire phil ruffin and fracking billionaire harold ham who both had primetime slots on Wednesday night. Put together, the 2016 RNC was a rare political event that con- consciously tried to amplify the voices of America's richest people as much as possible. 
and in doing so it revealed something interesting regarding how Trump thinks about wealth and human character. Trump isn't the only billionaire, or even a billionaire, to make a foray into politics, but it's hard to imagine, say, Michael Bloomberg surrounding himself with fellow billionaires at an event like this. That's not because Bloomberg is some kind of class traitor or whatever. It's because Bloomberg views his money as a tool that lets him be involved in politics rather than evidence of his inherently superior character. That was the only case that was ever, last night or any point, made for uh, the fitness for office of Donald Trump, that he was rich and so therefore must have good ideas that makes the end, the idea of inviting yet more rich people seem foolhardy, likely to backfire and make Bloomberg seem out of touch and detached from ordinary Americans. Had he done something like Trump, by contrast, really does see his wealth as evidence of superior character. That's the entire basis of his public personality. It's evidence that he has killer instincts, won't give up, works harder than the rest, and so on. And Trump has been able to sell that idea and that self-image to the broader public, first on The Apprentice and now during the campaign. There's no other reason for that gaudy gold furniture other than that. It's not nice. It's not even comfortable. But it shows that I'm rich and uh, I'm more worthy than you. Third winner of the night, Ivanka Trump. I think we have to agree with that one. Uh, Ivanka has a tough line to walk this election. On the one hand, Donald is her father and her boss. <laughs> boss, interesting. And she needs to stay on his good side and to remain one of his close advisors for the sake of her career and future. And maybe, maybe, maybe saving some semblance of the, you know, the actual uh, rule of law in the country and uh, let's not execute all the women, etc. On the other hand, she's an elite, educated New Yorker who runs in very liberal circles and who risks greatly damaging her brand as a sophisticated, cosmopolitan, smart businesswoman by tying herself too closely to an over-the-top nationalist campaign that repeatedly attacks the kind of city-dwelling media and cultural elites whom she counts as friends. Problem. So Ivanka came up with a rather impressive solution. Praise her father as a man, but otherwise, talk about motherhood. No one watching this campaign to date would think that Donald Trump is particularly interested in the needs and concerns of working women. Just five years ago, he attacked a lawyer in a deposition for breastfeeding, declaring the act disgusting, disgusting. But to hear Ivanka tell it, Trump is running primarily to help upper middle class women lean in. Yeah, I mean, that should be pointed out, right? Is that, uh, well, what this is really all about is, well, if you're in, if you're, all right. Uh, sometimes hot chicks get pregnant with other dudes and they become moms and it's gross, but sometimes they're MILFs. So let's let them have some time off so they can do their booby stuff at home with the babies and even come back to work being hot for us and serving beer out of the carts at the golf course. That, okay, we might need that. The golf course, the beer girl, the beer cart girl might get pregnant. You know, but she might be a favorite of the members, so we'll bring her back, even though she's disgusting and used up. That's his platform for women. Ugh. Anyway, uh, but of course, she doesn't say it that way. As a mother of three young children, right? As a mother myself, I know how hard it is to work while raising a family. I also know I'm more fortunate than most. Thank God she followed it up with. American families need relief. Policies that allow women with children to thrive should not be novelties. They should be the norm. Is this a fair point? Absolutely. Does it have literally anything to do with Donald Trump? Not really, no. While Ivanka praised her father's mentorship of women executives and claimed he walked the walk on pay equity... The focus on this long portion of the speech was primarily to make viewers think Ivanka Trump is the same person with reasonable ideas about making work friendlier to mothers, not Donald Trump is a champion of gender equality. The latter idea is just too implausible to imagine, uh, but the former could work. And the more important message for Ivanka to get across is she's going to revive her career after her father's likely election loss. There you go. Big losers of the night, the three losers, Donald Trump. Guess what? Here's the thing about Trump's fear-based message. It probably won't work. Uh, you know, we go to the polls on that one. Stuart Stevens' comment is noted here. There's a reason no Senate race is featuring crime. This is a strange decision by the Trump campaign. Uh, it is, one might say, sad. Peter Thiel, another of the losers mentioned... While leftist outlets sometimes stereotype Silicon Valley as a cesspool of Randian objectivism gone awry, the reality is, great journalist Greg Ferenstein has written, 
is that the tech industry is dominated by center-left Dems, who might be a bit more sympathetic to anti-regulatory efforts by companies like Uber, but broadly support the safety net, environmental protection, and LGBTQ rights. And Silicon Valley is definitely on board with trade and immigration. Tech is a remarkably globalized sector. Code has a way of bridging language and cultural gaps. And the Internet has made cooperation between programmers in Denmark and Japan and South Africa and Brazil and beyond not just possible but easy. So what's up with this guy? So the decision of Peter Thiel, fellow Facebook board member and larger-than-life Silicon Valley VC, to speak at the convention seems destined to marginalize him and reduce what moral and intellectual authority had in that world in a lasting way. He's a powerful figure, but not so powerful, that disgust over his decision to so publicly promote the most bigoted major party nominee in recent memory won't hurt him. Well, good. Hope it does. And then finally, big loser, Rens Priebus. Uh, one of the stranger moments of Thursday night, I missed it entirely, was the airing of a brief video featuring successful 2014 GOP Senate candidates enthusiastically praising RNC for its help. Uh, let's, uh, Capito in uh, West Virginia pumped about how it let her tailor her message to West Virginia. Wow, gee whiz. Cory Gardner loved their Latino outreach program. Golly gee. And Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina was into the phone banking operation. It was like an ad or an infomercial trying to persuade people set on running for office, but somehow undecided on what party to run under to pick the Republicans. How can I... All of this is from the Republican Party? Yeah. How can I find out more? You know, click the Learn More button or call 1-800. And so, you know, you don't say. That's amazing. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, a quick rundown of the three winners and three losers with some additional explanatory material because if Vox available to you will uh, have uh, have it inserted into the roundup post later on with Scott's able help. Thank God he's here to help me out with this thing because I got stuff to do after I get off the air. Believe it or not, man, you know, the only reason I can do any sorts of errands, exercise or just decompress for a minute is because he's there to help, uh, which leads me to a good pitch for more fundraising so that I can better appreciate him or better uh, demonstrate the appreciation. And then one day this laptop is going to give out. And also it would be nice if I could convince my wife that this was a worthwhile endeavor. That might uh, There should be some take home <laughs> from this. It uh, might be nice. Uh, eventually, I guess... Uh, the kids will get old enough that they don't need uh, dad around all day in case of medical emergency. Or they'll go to college, for instance, and I'll say, oh, I needed to pay for this. And then she'll say, that's why you shouldn't have done the radio show that whole time. Oh, I knew it. I knew there was something. I felt this looming presence in the background. But the kids, they're so cute. I wasn't thinking college. So uh, everybody uh, send my kids to college through, I don't know, uh, PayPal. Well, not pay. I don't want to. Make Peter Thiel rich either. Patreon. I don't know. Use that. Uh, it's as good as any. My goodness. What a great fundraising pitch I just made. This is the worst ever. I'll have to write a script for that one. Uh, America is being killed by not giving me a bunch of m money. Uh, this needs work. Anyway, I'll switch gears. I did say that I had something related to... Uh, that, that Ivanka's speech reminded me of. And this is it. This is the, now I found the worst fundraising pitch ever with the worst uh, transition, the worst segue ever. Uh, okay, I can do this. Don Bovasso, who I do not know, has written this piece and published it at medium.com, which I still don't really understand. But it seems like a giant, like, open public blog. Who cares? She makes a great point. Oh, and I think maybe there's a little bit of ID for her at the bottom. No, I guess not. Anyway, she makes clear in the piece she's an advertising executive, a creative director at that. So uh, here's a good point. So Ivanka, you could take this and run with it. Here it is. Ready? Total shift. Expense policies are a woman's problem. What do you mean by that? Here we go. This is very clearly done. I'm just going to read it. Last year, 
my previous employer, through a very thoughtful, generous appreciation dinner for our creative leadership team. You know, if you're a a white-collar type, an exec type working in an office situation, you've run into these things. It's nice, right? We're going to have a team building opportunity or whatever. or the, We're all going out for drinks. So, so she's an ad executive, okay, a creative director in an advertising agency. So last year, my previous employer threw a very thoughtful, generous appreciation dinner for our creative leadership team. The dinner was scheduled for 6.30 p.m. on a weeknight, right? Totally normal. I am a single mom living in downtown Boston which meant that I'd have to arrange for a sitter from about 6.30 or 6 p.m. to midnight at $20 an hour. We don't hire babysitters all that often because I'm sitting here on my butt doing nothing, so I'm the babysitter. My wife, who very often has to go to these sorts of appreciation dinners or team-building exercises or got to travel for work, uh, you know, I'm home, so it's okay. Uh, in other words, we have the reverse situation of this, but the rest of America uh, very often deals with it in the more traditional setting, or, or even with both parents working, you run into, I, I should stop. She does a very good a job of explaining this. Who cares about me? Okay, I'm a single mom living downtown in Boston. I just was caught by surprise by the $20 an hour for the babysitter she'd have to get. Okay, add in some tasty burger for my son and the sitter. Her tip on top of 20, and an Uber home, and this appreciation dinner was going to end up costing me about $200. I'm going to appreciate you. I'm going to take you out to dinner. I'm going to pay for your dinner. It's going to be great. You'll, I appreciate you appreciating me appreciating you, but you have to spend $200. Not on me. You don't have to give it back to me, but you got to, $200 has to evaporate in order for you to be able to afford to come to my appreciating you about, I don't know, 75 possibly possibly $100 worth with drinks. So when I received the invite, I couldn't just check my calendar and accept or decline. I had to have an internal debate with myself about the pros and cons of going and what this dinner would cost me. She's an executive. She's not worried about the $200 it's going to cost her. It's other kinds of costs. Again, she explains it beautifully. But yes, there's the financial interest. Was this dinner worth $200? It is. And here's why. I love my coworkers and genuinely have fun when we go out and carouse. I don't know if that was the right word, but okay. I also recognize the importance of being on the creative leadership team. Leadership team. Hmm. Particularly as a unicorn, she says in air quotes there, one of the few female creative directors, CDs, in advertising, right? So she's a rarity. And why going to events like this matter, both personally and professionally, I decided to go. She knows there's an awful lot of office political capital she loses. If she makes the very sensible economic decision, $200 out of my pocket doesn't make any sense, then she loses out in office politics. No promotion for you. You're not a team player. People look askance at her. Shade is being thrown, if I if I may appropriate the phrase, right? So it's not an economic thing, really. So, okay, it's worth $200. I decided to go. At the dinner, I found out that several of my male coworkers were staying in the adjacent hotel because they lived too far out of town to drink and drive home safely. So, you know, sensible decision. But think about that, right? As someone sensitive to how the workplace is biased toward men, I couldn't help but wonder if they would get to expense their hotel stay. Huh. Meanwhile, their wives were at home taking care of the kids. For free, obviously. Not $20 an hour, not a tip, not an Uber, not Tasty Burger, not nothing. No $200 out of their pocket. In addition to no $200 out of their pocket for taking a hotel room because they can expense it. Why can they expense it? I mean... That doesn't make any sense, right? But it's true. Let's go on. I, too, obviously, had barriers to attending the event, but mine were less traditional and, therefore, perhaps, not tax-deductible for the company and, therefore, less likely to be a covered expense. Get it? It's not that 
Well, everybody knows that if you're invited out on the town for drinks, you got to have a hotel room. It naturally follows. What do you mean? I have to, you're going to expense that you were too drunk to drive home? Eh, that's not really what I'm expensing. I'm expensing a hotel room, you see. And everybody knows, I mean, hotel rooms are things that get expensed, right? You're not going to have a hard time explaining that one to HR, really. Well, I mean, if HR says, I'm not going to approve, the, uh, maybe they don't do the, uh, the accounting, whatever. Uh, expenses, people aren't necessarily going to say, yes, you can have a, a, you can, we'll reimburse you for drinking too much. But a hotel, it, the point is, when you put it on the forms at the IRS, the IRS is not going to look twice at it. They're going to say, hotel, right, that's, a, that's a thing that gets expensed. Yes, it's traditional. We don't ask. You got a hotel because you were too drunk. That doesn't enter into it. There's no place to check that off on the IRS form. It's just, it's what people who work and they do it a lot. Don't worry about it. Uh, but her expenses, so she's not going to get too drunk to drive home or whatever, or she's going to take an Uber and, and you can expense Uber and taxis true, but her real expenses were babysitter and tasty burger. How is that deductible? for the company uh babysitting no we don't traditionally eh, it doesn't really work that way after a heated and somewhat wine fueled discussion with the department head that night i went insane about the sexism of the situation and to be fair he quickly agreed and after many emails back and forth with finance they covered my babysitting that night to my former employer's credit they often paid for my toddler to come with me when I needed to travel. And I recognize how progressive this is. Because a lot of places would be like, what are you effing kidding me? Have your spouse take care. Oh, it doesn't work that way for you? Or you don't have a spouse? Or they're effing busy and with their own careers? Right? But they're very good about it. Imagine that. That's a terrific arrangement. So she recognizes how progressive this is. Part of their ongoing effort to improve policies that have such a high impact on women. Speaking of such things, Ivanka. However, these have been exceptions I've had to ask for, and many women aren't in the position to ask for, much less get this kind of approval. This is something that leadership team women can finagle for themselves, in other words. And thank God they can, but not all women can, and not even all leadership women can. At most companies, to return to the text here, and everywhere else I've worked, non-household expenses such as hotel stays, meals, transportation, and even laundry, are reimbursable expenses for maintaining your home while you are traveling or working, for example, say babysitting or even tougher, cat sitting, they're not expensable. I have never been able to understand the difference between these two groupings. If I incur an expense because I am doing something above and beyond for my company, Shouldn't my company pay for that expense? Yes, it should. Does it matter if that expense happens inside my apartment or not? I'm traveling for work. Does hotel get covered? Yes. Does what I have to pay for in order to maintain my home while I'm gone because I don't have a spouse to work here for free get covered? No. Household expenses are not covered because expense policies and IRS codes are still biased towards men. Most of these policies were created when men were traveling and women were home taking care of the kids. When the male leaders of this world travel, there is an embedded assumption that they have women at home maintaining the hearth, cooking their meals, taking care of their children, feeding their dogs, watering their plants. They do not need to pay for these services because it is built in as part of the traditional family unit. They don't need to pay for babysitting, though they do need drinks and definitely cannot do their own laundry. You can get $30 for takeout if you work late because your wife isn't there to cook you dinner or $30 for scotch if you want to drink your face off, but you can't get $30 for a sitter because your wife is at home with the kids. The advertising industry loves to talk about the lack of balance of women in leadership. But there's a lot of admiring the problem and not enough action and financial investment that actually enables women to participate equally. 
During the normal work week, I pay $55, 55 hours a week in daycare. I pay four, 55 do- hours a week in daycare. I don't want to say dollars. And that is part of my responsibility as a full-time employee, just as it is my responsibility to get myself to work and buy myself lunch every day. But when I'm on the road or working above and beyond, these necessities become my employer's responsibility. Why is child care different? Because it's a woman's problem. The women are supposed to be doing it. And when the women don't do it, there's no help from the government, no help from the company, no help from anybody. If you don't live in the traditional family unit, there's no help for you. Although, to be fair, I guess it's fine if you work in the traditional family unit and dad stays home. But that's just, you know... Me doing the work for free, again, I mean, certainly don't expect any reimbursement for any of it. Uh, but yeah, I thought, what a fantastic point. And look how far they stretched the point, right? Well, gee whiz, I expensed the scotch because the stress of working this job, my goodness, I tell you, I need to be able to unwind. It's, uh, it's like mental health care a little bit, right? All of that, fine, yes. But <laughs> you want to deal with the scotch by staying over in a hotel? Expensed. You want to deal with the scotch by staying over in a hotel, but I don't have a free babysitter at home, so you want to expense the babysitter? Nah, no, 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 can't help you with it. Anyway, I thought a great point, well done, well made, well written, and a good way to end uh, for the week today. Something else to talk about other than how terrible uh, everything is or how terrible Trump himself is. Now, time to pass the torch to the guys at the After Show for Angle of Repose Friday on the After Show, including the following things. I neglected to talk about up to this point. Kentucky issues emergency prisoner home releases to curb its jail overcrowding after sweeping its streets of quote-unquote undesirables. Wolf Point, Montana police and city officials packed Native Americans into a horrifying makeshift camp before the annual rodeo there. My goodness, uh, those would have been all the undesirables that they swept off the street, yes. Uh, missed the punctuation in between there. And police departments across the nation utilize a $2 field drug test kit that sends thousands of innocent people to jail. Definitely on my radar. Thanks to Judy Vincent. I didn't get to it this week. Thankfully, the guys at the after show will, and they'll be doing it all next. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The k in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Thanks for listening. From the world of science, on the last half of the after show, shares of Tesla stock fell 3% after Elon Musk revealed the second part of his master plan. I wonder what it was. And the world's most sensitive detector fails to shed light on dark matter. Damn it, I can't believe it happened again. All that coming up next.